Blind from birth and musically inclined from the young age of eight, Stevie Wonder turned out to be one hell of an incredible artist. At just 13, Stevie achieved a number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100, and by 2016, he had amassed 25 Grammy Awards. The Isn't She Lovely singer was also celebrated globally and even given an award by the President of the United States, Barack Obama. However, behind the scenes of his remarkable achievements and public success, there's a heartbreaking side to his personal life that doesn't get enough attention. But before we dissect and analyze this part of his life, let's take a quick look at how it all started for Wonder. Born Steveland Hardaway Judkins in Saginaw, Michigan, on May 13, 1950, Stevie was the third of five children born to his mom, Lula Mae Hardaway, and the second of Hardaway's two children with his dad, Calvin Judkins. When Stevie was born, the doctor made a terrible mistake that cost him his sight for life. You see, as an infant, Stevie was born six weeks premature, and that meant he had to be in an incubator. However, the doctor made the mistake of giving him too much oxygen, which resulted in retinopathy of prematurity, a disease that prevents the eyes from functioning and often causes the retinas to detach. This one mistake left baby Stevie blind permanently. When young Stevie was four years old, his parents separated, and with that, his mother moved the family to Detroit. There, young Stevie found solace and inspiration in the Whitestone Baptist Church, where he sang in the choir. This was where his musical journey truly began, sparking a passion that would shape his life. By the age of eight, Stevie was already showing remarkable talent. He taught himself to play the piano, harmonica, and drums. Along with a friend, he formed a duo called Stevie and John, performing on street corners and at local parties. This was just the beginning of what would become a legendary career in music. In 1961, at just 11 years old, Stevie Wonder wrote his first song, Lonely Boy. He performed it for Ronnie White of The Miracles, and White was immediately struck by Stevie's raw talent and unique voice. He knew there was something special about the young boy and was eager to help him shine. White arranged an audition at Motown, where Stevie and his mother met with Barry Gordy, the label's CEO. Just like White Gordy was so impressed by Stevie's abilities and charisma that quickly signed him to Motown's Tamla label. Before the ink dried on the contract, producer Clarence Paul playfully called Stevie the eighth wonder of the world. However, the nickname was soon shortened to Stevie Wonder, making it easier to remember and just as iconic. Given Stevie's young age, Motown created a special rolling five-year contract. The contract stipulated that Stevie's royalties would be held in trust until he turned 21, ensuring his financial security. In the meantime, Stevie and his mother received a weekly stipend to help cover their expenses. At the time, Stevie was paid $2.50 per week, which, when adjusted for inflation, is about $25.49 today. This was a modest amount, but it helped the family make ends meet. Additionally, to ensure that Stevie's education didn't suffer while he was touring, Motown provided a private tutor in order to allow Stevie continue developing his musical talents while also keeping up with his studies. With the guidance of his producer and songwriter Clarence Paul, Stevie Wonder began to work on his musical skills. Clarence Paul not only served as a mentor, but he also collaborated closely with Stevie, and this helped him navigate the early stages of his career. In their first project together, they created the album Tribute to Uncle Ray. The album was recorded when Stevie was just 11 years old and was primarily a collection of Ray Charles covers as one of Stevie's biggest influences. The album also featured an original composition by Stevie and Clarence called Sunset, which showcased Stevie's incredible songwriting talent, even at such a young age. Their next project was The Jazz Soul of Little Stevie, an instrumental album that not only flaunted Stevie's versatility as a musician, but also showed how much he had grown in such a short time. This album was largely composed by Clarence Paul. However, Stevie co-wrote two tracks, Wondering and Session Number 112. These albums allowed Stevie to experiment and find his own voice, even as he was learning from the greats around him. 
As Stevie's confidence grew, so did the anticipation for his debut single. Initially, Mother Thank You was slated to be his first release. However, Barry Gordy, the head of Motown, decided to go with a different track. I call it Pretty Music, but the old people call it the blues. This song was chosen to showcase Stevie's youthful energy and his knack for blending different musical styles. Released in the summer of 1962, the song nearly made it onto the Billboard Hot 100, peaking at number 101. This right here was another sign for his management that Wonder had some serious potential for the music market. And less than two years later, Stevie Wonder proved it. At the end of 1962, Wonder joined the Motortown Review, touring the Chitlin circuit of theaters across America that accepted black artists. At the Regal Theater Chicago, his 20-minute performance was recorded and released in May 1963 as the album recorded live The 12-Year-Old Genius. One of the singles from the album, Fingertips, was also released that same month, and it turned out to be Stevie Wonder's first major hit that put him on the map. The song was so good that it became a number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100 when Wonder was just 13. At that age, Stevie Wonder became the youngest artist ever to top the chart. But what made it even more amazing was the fact that the single was simultaneously number one on the R&B chart, the first time that had ever occurred in the history of music. Sadly, it would also turn out to be the only hit Stevie would release in years. Over the next couple of years, none of Wonder's songs came close to the time of success Little Fingers brought him. As a matter of fact, Almost all the songs he released flopped big time. This was especially because his voice was changing as he got older, and this made him lose the unique touch he was initially known for. Some Motown executives were even considering canceling his recording contract. However, Sylvia Moy persuaded label owner Barry Gordy to give Wonder another chance. With one more shot left between making it big time and having his career ripped out of his hands, Wonder knew he had to double up on his hustle, and that's exactly what he did. Wonder got to work with Moy and almost immediately began to see results. They created the song Uptight Everything's Alright, which turned out to be a hit. After his revamped success, Wonder went on to have a number of other hits during the mid-1960s, including With a Child's Heart, and Blowin' in the Wind, a Bob Dylan song co-sung by his mentor and producer, Clarence Paul. Around this time, he also began to work in the Motown songwriting department, composing songs both for himself and his label mates. In 1968, he recorded an album of instrumental soul jazz tracks, mostly harmonica solos, under the title Yvette's Red Now, which is Stevie Wonder spelled backward. The album failed to get much attention, and its only single, a cover of Burt Bacharach and Hal David's Alfie, only reached number 66 on the U.S. pop charts and number 11 on the U.S. adult contemporary charts. However, despite the drawback, he managed to score several hits between 1967 and 1970, and even went on to record the hit single, Signed, Sealed, Delivered I'm Yours, which was his first ever self-produced song. By 1970, Wonder began to find ways to break out of the grasp of his label. To begin with, he collaborated with the Spinners and co-wrote and played multiple instruments on their hit song, It's a Shame. The success of the song was particularly important because Stevie was at a crossroads with Motown. Since he had been with the label since he was a child and was now on his way to his 21st birthday, he felt the itch for more creative freedom. And just like he had hoped, the song served as leverage in his negotiations with Motown's Barry Gordy for greater creative freedom. As his contract with Motown approached its end in May 1971, Stevie decided he was going to let it expire. For many artists, this would be a risky step, especially at such a young age. But Stevie was ready for a change. He wanted more control over his music and wasn't afraid to demand it. Lucky for the young star, this decision led to a groundbreaking new contract with Motown in 1972, which was unheard of at the time. The new deal granted Stevie a higher royalty rate and significant artistic autonomy, 
marking a new chapter in his career where he could fully explore his creative vision. Later that year, Wonder released the album Talking Book, which featured the iconic num one hit Superstition. The album also included another chart-topping song, You Are the Sunshine of My Life. In order to broaden his audience and move beyond being seen solely as an R&B artist, Stevie also decided to tour with the Rolling Stones. This tour not only helped him reach a wider audience, but also boosted the success of his hits Superstition and You Are the Sunshine of My Life, both of which eventually won three Grammy Awards between them. However, just like any other successful legend, Wonder did have his challenges along his journey, one of which almost cost the singer his life. On August 6, 1973, Stevie Wonder faced a major setback when he was seriously injured in an automobile accident while on tour in North Carolina. The car he was riding in collided with the back of a truck, leaving him in a coma for four days. The accident resulted in a partial loss of his sense of smell and a temporary loss of taste, which was really traumatizing for the singer because being blind from birth, he learned to experience his environment through his other senses. However, if there's one thing Stevie has consistently shown since he was a child, it's his incredible resilience and determination. Despite his doctor's orders to refrain from performing, Stevie's commitment to his community shone through just months later. In November 1973, he performed at a homecoming benefit for Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina, a school facing financial difficulties at the time. As a member of the university's board of trustees, Stevie not only performed but also rallied other artists, including Exuma, LaBelle, and the Chambers Brothers to join the cause. The concert was a success, raising over $10,000 for the school's scholarship fund. Stevie's dedication to giving back, even in the face of personal challenges, was inspiring. The following year, Stevie embarked on a European tour where he graced stages in France at the Meetum Convention in Cannes, the Rainbow Theatre in London, and even appeared on the German television show Musikladen. His return to the United States was marked by a sold-out concert at Madison Square Garden in March 1974, where he mesmerized the audience with both high-energy performances and long, soulful improvisations, particularly on tracks like Living for the City. Later in July that year, Stevie released the album Fulfillingness First Finale, which quickly climbed the charts. The album featured two major hits, the number one song You Haven't Done Nothing and the top 10 hit Boogie on Reggae Woman. His efforts were recognized with three Grammy Awards, including Album of the Year, solidifying his place as a leading figure in music. That same year, Stevie participated in a legendary jam session in Los Angeles with former Beatles John Lennon and Paul McCartney, an event that became known as the bootleg album A Toot and a Snore in 74. He also co-wrote and produced Stevie Wonder Presents Sarita, an album for his former wife, Sarita Wright. By the age of 25, Stevie had already won two consecutive Grammy Awards, one in 1974 for Inner Visions and another in 1975 for Fulfillingness First Finale. His streak of success was so remarkable that when Paul Simon won the Album of the Year Grammy in 1976 for Still Crazy After All These Years, he humorously remarked, I'd like to thank Stevie Wonder, who didn't make an album this year. That same year, Stevie released Songs in the Key of Life, a sprawling double album that many consider his magnum opus. The album, which debuted at number one on the Billboard charts and remained there for 14 non-consecutive weeks, featured a mix of celebratory and introspective tracks. I Wish and Sir Duke became number one hits while Isn't She Lovely celebrated the birth of his daughter Aisha. The album also tackled deeper social themes with songs like Love's In Need of Love Today and Village Ghetto Land. Songs in the Key of Life won Album of the Year and two other Grammys, and it is widely regarded as one of the greatest albums in pop music history, ranking fourth on Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. And to think that this was just the beginning. The achievements Stevie Wonder would go on to accumulate in the following decade would only further cement his status as one of the greatest artists of all time. In the 1980s, 
Stevie Wonder continued to evolve artistically while achieving significant commercial success. He kicked off the decade with asterisk Stevie Wonder's Journey Through the Secret Life of Plants, an instrumental soundtrack that showcased his early use of digital recording technology and electronic music. This period saw Stevie embracing new sounds and experimenting with advanced music samplers, setting the stage for a series of groundbreaking works. One of Stevie's major achievements during this time was the release of Hotter Than July, which became his first platinum-selling single album. The record featured the iconic track Happy Birthday, which played a crucial role in Stevie's successful campaign to make Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday a national holiday. Wonder continued to break new ground with Stevie Wonder's original Musiquarium One, a compilation that included classics alongside new hits like Do I Do and Ribbon in the Sky. His collaboration with Paul McCartney on Ebony and Ivory, a song promoting racial harmony, also became a global sensation. The soundtrack album The Woman in Red featured the smash hit I Just Called to Say I Love You, which won an Academy Award. Despite political backlash for dedicating the award to Nelson Mandela, Stevie remained a vocal advocate for social justice, earning recognition from the United Nations for his anti-apartheid stance. Stevie's commercial success continued with albums like In Square Circle, featuring the chart-topping part-time lover. He also collaborated with a variety of artists, from Chaka Khan to the Eurythmics, demonstrating his versatility and broad appeal. His involvement in charitable projects, such as We Are The World, highlighted his ongoing commitment to using music as a force for good. Throughout the 1980s, Stevie Wonder not only crafted hit records, but also used his platform to address important social issues, solidifying his legacy as both a musical innovator and a voice for change, even till this very day. However, Beyond all the fame and achievements, Stevie had a storm brewing in his personal life behind the curtains. You see, despite being blind, Stevie Wonder had his way when he came to women. Beyond his incredibly likable personality, Wonder also had a voice that could sweep any woman off her feet. Throughout his life, Wonder has been married three different times, with the first being way back in 1970, when he was just 20 years old. The 25 Grammy Award winner also has nine children with five different women, with most of his kids being musical geniuses, just like their father. His first marriage was to Motown singer-songwriter Sarita Wright from 1970 to 1972. Despite their divorce, they continued to collaborate musically, with Sarita contributing to Stevie's projects, including the 1995 album Conversation Peace. Stevie's second marriage was to fashion designer Kai Millard, which lasted from 2001 to 2012. They initially separated in 2009, and Stevie filed for divorce in 2012. In 2017, he married Tamika Bracey, marking his third marriage. Despite the singer's numerous children, it is his first daughter, Aisha, who has always taken the spotlight in his career, even when she was a baby. Born in 1975 to wonder, and his then-partner Yolanda Simmons, Aisha became widely known as the inspiration for her dad's famous song, Isn't She Lovely? Wonder included a recording of baby Aisha splashing in the bathtub at the end of the track. Growing up, Aisha mostly lived with her mother in New Jersey, but she was present for many significant moments in her father's career, including his induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the 1996 Grammy Awards. However, Stevie's ways with women turned out to be the root of one of the biggest scandals in the entertainment industry. And that is all thanks to a woman named Angela McGaffey. The story begins in 1986 when Stevie first started showing interest in Angela. Things got more serious in 1996, with Stevie convincing Angela to leave her job as a wardrobe consultant and move into his Los Angeles estate. They had a mutual understanding. Stevie would handle the finances, while Angela would take care of the home. But their relationship hit a rough patch when Stevie met Kai Millard, a freelance art director in 1999 at a New York nightclub. Stevie's interest in Kai was evident, and despite Kai's initial hesitation, they ended up talking all night. Just six months later, Stevie and Kai were engaged, and they tied the knot in September 2001. 
This sudden shift left Angela in a difficult position. Just a month after Stevie's wedding to Kai, Angela filed a $30 million lawsuit against him, alleging that he had given her herpes and kept it a secret. Stevie responded with his own lawsuit, claiming that Angela had taken $160,000 worth of furniture when they broke up. The case eventually went to mediation, and the outcome was kept under wraps. In the end, you can say even the biggest legend in the world can find themselves tangled up in a messy scandal sometimes.